that was terrible. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And good afternoon. Will the class please come to order? It's always this table. Welcome to Lunch with Books. My name is Sean. I'll be your host. If you would, if you have a cell phone, would you please mute it now or put it on vibrate? Something like that. If you'd like to be in our email list and you aren't already, the box is over there. It's uh, 17 years old. I made that when I first started here and I'm still using the same box. That's why it looks the way it does. Have you ever taken anything out of the box? I have. Some people have to be smart. <laughs> Next Tuesday, December 6th, uh, Tom Brighting will be back. He is, uh, he every year goes to the Woody Guthrie Festival in Oklahoma, so he's going to do his own tribute called Walking Woody's Road. So live music right here, the, the music of uh, Woody Guthrie. And then on the, the 8th, which is Thursday, the People's University Special Edition Apollo 17, 50 years. Chuck Wood and Gene Finstein will teach, and it'll be, I'm told, highly interactive and fun. It's only a two-class series, but uh, we'll have another one coming up on January 5th called Ancient History. That will be eight classes into February. So we'll probably have great weather for that, I'm sure. And, uh, but we'll cover Egypt, Rome, Greece primarily, and also the Pompeii tragedy, the volcano. Uh, so that'll be January 5th. And the 13th, Tuesday the 13th, here in this room, The Coal Trap, How West Virginia Was Left Behind in the Clean Energy Revolution. Jamie Van Nostrand will be here, and that will be December 13th. Our guest today is Emily Hilliard. She is a folklorist and writer based in central Appalachia. She's the former West Virginia State folklorist and the founding director of the West Virginia Folklife Program. Uh, you can find more about her at emilyehilliard.com. And her new book that she'll be telling us about today is Making Our Future, Visionary Folklore and Everyday Culture in Appalachia. Here is Emily Hilliard. Thanks, Sean, and uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. It's always nice to be up and wheeling. Um, so I'm going to take us through kind of a 20-minute tour of my book, uh, which draws from my work as the West Virginia State Folklorist. And um, this is kind of a non-exhaustive whirlwind tour through the book. Um, you can kind of think of it as a trailer, uh, like for a movie. Um, so I'm not going to give away all the good parts, but I will. Um, give you some teasers of what you might expect to find in the book. So I'm going to start by reading a little bit from the introduction. I have spent much of the past six years traveling in and across West Virginia, crisscrossing mountains, hollers, creeks, and rivers, along dirt roads and highways, on fieldwork trips to interview quilters, fiddlers, striking teachers, gospel singers, miniature makers, independent pro wrestlers, neon sign makers, herbalists, marble collectors, gamers, woodworkers, playwrights, pastors, turkey call makers, and more. I've been welcomed into homes, barns, churches, and workshops, and spent long afternoons around kitchen tables, sharing meals prepared by home cooks of traditional Filipino, North Indian, Greek, Swiss, and the particular amalgam of predominantly Scots Irish, German, Native American, and African American cuisines now thought of as Appalachian foodways. I've eaten a lot of hot dogs and pepperoni rolls. I've attended a Lebanese Mirajan festival, a Baptist singing convention, local independent professional wrestling shows, ramp suppers, and Serbian chicken blasts. Visited a Hare Krishna temple, gone two-stepping, harvested sorghum, and been a guest at a Ramadan fast-breaking dinner. I've toured farms and gardens and studios with dogs and cats trailing along as their owners shared family stories and personal accounts of their work, artistic inspiration, and on a few occasions, divine visions. I've been given several dozen fresh eggs, a handmade broom, a hand-hewn wooden bowl, a rug cooking kit, loaves of salt-rising bread, books, plants, and reel-to-reel tapes. 
Many of the people I've worked with I now call friends. The intimate glimpse I've been offered of this place has been entrusted to me with extreme generosity, openness, and intention. So in this book, I draw from my field work uh, conducted when I was the West Virginia State Folklorist uh, from 2015 to 2021. And though folklore often gets coded as the untrue, the trivial, or the antiquated ways, um, and in West Virginia, particularly the old-timey ways of white folks in the mountains, uh, folklore is actually very much a part of contemporary life um, of every cultural community. It's the many forms of creativity in our lives that are shared between people and rooted in place. Um, the in-jokes you might have with your family, uh, the creative twist you add to an heirloom recipe, uh, the way you might alter a knitting pattern, <laughs> um, a lullaby you sing to a child at bedtime, and the regional foodways of a particular place, um, and even the meme edited and shared online. And in my work in West Virginia and in this book, what I'm really thinking about is what is the folklore of the 21st century, uh, particularly in the mountain state. Um, and as I start to question in the conclusion, uh, what is the folklore of the future and how do we have a role in shaping that? So how is folklore being used by diverse uh, people in the cultural communities that practice it here in the mountain state? And how do we present a vision of that that engages all diverse communities rather than a whitewashed version? Um, how can it be a forward-thinking um, approach rather than backward-looking and dynamic rather than stuck in time? So in this book, you'll see an attention to the sites and communities where folk life is actually being generated and shared in Appalachia today. Um, the Wrestling Ring and the Old Time Festival, the Facebook group and the mosque, the zine and the Union Hall. And as you probably know, my field work occurred during a distinct cultural moment in West Virginia with population decline, resource extraction, and subsequent environmental degradation, loss of jobs, uh, systemic racism, and an opioid crisis. And all of those things disrupt communities uh, that folklore comes from and is transmitted within. But communities uh, persist and um, still continue to practice their vibrant cultural traditions and adapting and evolving them um, to result in new forms. Uh, these vernacular forms can be grounding force linking local communities across time and place. So to look at the way contemporary folk life functions in a specific place like West Virginia means bringing together and drawing connections across some of the seemingly disparate topics included under folk umbrella. So that's things like foodways, dance, dress, music, craft, traditional art, language. Um, you might know Carol Doherty of the um, Lebanese um, Maronite church here in Wheeling. Uh, folklore allows us to ask what do these things have to do with each other and how are people acting in community uh, using these creative forms to shape a new reality for them. So this book really looks at how communities in the mountain state engage with disparate forms of folklore, considers why those forms are meaningful, accounts for them, and identifies through lines across them, all as part of the modern makeup of folk life in the state. And it argues for a future-focused uh, collaborative approach to folklore and other cultural work. So I do that with eight chapters in the book, which you can kind of think of as case studies uh, on community-based contemporary traditions. And those are on the collective counter-narrative of a multiracial coal camp community in Scotts Run, West Virginia, uh, non-professional women songwriters in country gospel and labor traditions, uh, the foodways of a West Virginia Swiss community in Helvetia, uh, the sense of place in the hometown of writer Breeze DJ Pancake in Milton, the expressive culture of the West Virginia teacher's strike, the cultural significance of the West Virginia hot dog, local independent pro wrestling as an Appalachian storytelling tradition that has a long history in the state, particularly here in the Ohio, along the Ohio River, and the post-apocalyptic vision of West Virginia presented and shaped by players in the video game 
Fallout 76. So I'm going to take you through a few of these chapters um, and some interesting tidbits I found while writing and researching them. So we can look at Scott's run, um, in, which is outside of Morgantown. It's a former um, coal camp community. It's multi-ethnic and multiracial and was documented by the Farm Security Administration photographers in the 1930s, uh, which inspired Eleanor Roosevelt's first New Deal homestead, Arthurdale. So many of the families in Scott's Run um, were relocated to Arthurdale, but Arthurdale only accepted white American-born families and those who were considered best off and without any radical political leanings. Um, so this was a coal camp after all, and particularly with um, immigrant communities, there was a lot of fear of a communist uprising. So they wanted to take families um, that they thought would not um, revolt in Arthurdale. Descendants of those who remained at Scott's Run um, maintain a counter narrative saying, although we didn't have the material resources we needed, uh, what Eleanor Roosevelt was trying to create in Arthurdale, we already had that in Scott's Run. Um, and we were integrated well before Morgantown <coughs> next door um, with an integrated pool and movie theater, uh, multiracial families and systems of care and mutual aid that went across racial and ethnic lines. And you can see in the photo, um, gospel musician Sarah Boyd Little, whose uh, choir sang at the White House for FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt when she was in high school, um, with WVU professor Eve Falks. And the woman in the middle of the photo is actually Sarah Boyd Little's sister. Um, so if you go look at these photos on the Library of Congress website, um, or go to the Library of Congress and look at them, um, none of the people are named, but everyone in Scott's Run knows who they are. I also worked with four different women songwriters, um, most of whom write songs not for public performance, but as a personal creative endeavor, kind of like journal writing. So through country gospel and labor songwriting conventions and a longstanding tradition of women's writing, uh, these four women maintain their respective songwriting practices. And in some cases, that was in service of their community or their faith or the union, um, specifically the UMWA in the case of Elaine Perkey, um, who I knew, who I know performed here in Wheeling. Um, and as part of personal catharsis and self-documentation. So one of the songwriters, Shirley Campbell, was the sister-in-law of bluegrass musician Olabelle Reed. And she had a song recorded by Grandpa Jones um, and another one which she says Ernest Tubbs stole. Um, and the song recorded by Grandpa Jones, I don't know if it will work to play, but um, it's on a live album of, of his called, and it's called Castles in the Air. Let's see. Oh, it's going to be very quiet. Um. If I could have my wish tonight upon the little star. I'd wish that I could hold you tight if I be me to fall. If I could make my dream come true, I'd dream it all again for you. But I'm just building castles in the air. Um, in another chapter, I look at the West Virginia teachers' strike uh, of 2018 and 2019 from a folkloric perspective, which really revealed how teachers and school service workers <laughs> used expressive culture as a form of resistance um, as they organized online and in physical spaces. So communicating through t-shirts, signs, foods, chants, songs, and digital memes uh, the teachers demonstrated the importance of care work in sustaining the everyday life of their communities. And to watch the teacher strike as it evolved, um, I was at the Capitol, I think, uh, seven of the nine days of the strike, um, taking photos and interviewing teachers. Um, it was really to witness the visionary possibilities of expressive culture and its ability to bolster group identity um, and forge a new reality in resistance to dominant power structures. And as it turns out, teachers are really good at making effective protest signs and memes. They put those bulletin board um, skills to use. 
So you can see here, um, this sign references Hazel Dickens' lyrics, we won't be bought, we won't be sold, to be treated right and fix P-E-I-A. Well, that's our goal. Um, we have a Daria sign here. Um, another We Outlasted, you know, flipping of um, water bottles as a trend among school kids. And fidget spinners, and We Will Outlast You. Um, we should have had a teacher proofread the bill. That's when the, um, the Senate and the House uh, couldn't agree on the correct version, and they let a typo in. So they passed a bill with a typo in it. Um, and then uh, West Virginia teachers go out on strike. West Virginia teachers defy union leadership. Continue wildcat strike. Striking West Virginia teachers begin wearing red bandanas to commemorate the Battle of Blair Mountain and Oklahoma teachers may soon follow joining West Virginia on strike. And um, what was really cool to see is the strike wave spread across the country um, and teachers in other states warning their um, legislators, don't make us go West Virginia on you. And I have to share this because it kind of leads into um, the next part, but um, educators singled out certain politicians like Mitch Carmichael who opposed the teachers and made the most egregious remarks about them and publicly shamed those politicians in digital spaces um, in kind of ways to reference West Virginia values of folklore. So in this case, pepperoni rolls, um, WVU football, and hot dogs, which I'll explain. But um, they kind of teased Mitch Carmichael by saying that he was a Pitt fan and he hates pepperoni rolls, which you know, are um, sacrilegious in West Virginia. And uh, that he orders ketchup on Yan's dogs. Yan's is a hot dog stand in Fairmont where you would get um, kicked out if you asked for slaw or ketchup. So leading into that, um, another chapter, Friends of Coleslaw, is on the West Virginia hot dog. And what I learned when I moved to West Virginia in 2015 is that West Virginia loves their hot dogs. A West Virginia dog um, generally consists of chili or sauce, um, depending on where you are, um, what you call it. Slaw, depending on your location above or below the slaw line, which is sort of like a Mason-Dixon of, con of condiments uh, that runs through the upper part of the state. Um, mustard and onions. And it was really clear in my early field work days that hot dogs were culturally significant to the state because, you know, especially in the southern coal fields, there wouldn't be much in the town, but there would be a hot dog joint. Um, but then when I looked into, um, did some historical research and looked into some old newspapers in West Virginia, it really revealed the immigration class, um, gender, and labor history of the beloved So a 1920s newspaper um, called Charleston, one of the greatest places on earth for hot dog eaters. Um, and at, at that time, the city had four hot dog stands, and at least three of which were owned by Greek immigrants. Um, and in this newspaper clip, um, it says more than 20,000 hot dogs sold in Charleston each day, um, which is pretty astounding because at that time, the population of Charleston was 39,400 people. <laughs> so that's like one hot dog for uh, every two, pe two people. Um, and in 1922, a, a city in the northern coal fields erupted in what I call the Fairmont Hot Dog Stand Wars of 1922, which was a racist and classist attempt by city leaders to shut down hot dog joints that were largely owned by immigrants um, and catered to the city's black, white, and immigrant working class. I think maybe my favorite chapter is on the independent pro wrestling um, as a West Virginia storytelling tradition, a tradition which has a long history in the Ohio River Valley. And I found some old articles about brawling matches um, up and down the Ohio River, um, predating the founding of the state, so definitely in Wheeling. Um, and I argue that wrestling is a vernacular form where wrestlers who take on the role of storytellers and most of the wrestlers I talked to said they identify
with their live local audiences. So one of the wrestlers I talked to said, you know, you are watching a movie and you can't really change the outcome of a movie, but with wrestling, you can. You can, um, by the way the, cl the crowd reacts or cheers or um, boos, um, that changes the outcome of a wrestling show. So it's kind of like um, an improv theater, um, particularly in these wrestling shows that happen in small coal field towns where there's few other opportunities for entertainment. And the content and themes of these carnivalesque shows enact popular tropes and engage with current events in a sort of mishmash of contradicting social and political opinions on race, class, and gender. So I talked to um, Richie Acevedo, whose father wrestled as the Cuban assassin. And that was you know, um, during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then um, he has taken on, the, he's the Cuban assassin number two, and wrestles with his um, son, who goes by the Cuban commando. Um, and these are his parents' passport photos, um, one from Puerto Rico and one from Cuba. Um, but uh, a lot of these wrestlers, although the kind of racialized stereotype gimmick is fading away, um, they might take on a gimmick um, related to current events to be the bad guy or the good guy. So bringing this all together is the idea of visionary folklore, which rather than thinking of folklore or cultural tradition as backward looking, reframes to tradition as a way that communities are actually shaping the future uh, by transforming yesterday into, um, into tomorrow. So I ask how can folklorists like me and other cultural workers work in collaboration with cultural communities to advocate not just for the sustainability but the ideal future of cultural traditions and the self-determination of communities that practice them. And these are lessons I learned from doing work with West Virginia communities. Um, and I'm truly grateful for that opportunity and all those who share their story with me um, and help make that, make that book a reality. So I will leave you with a short reading from the end of the book's introductions, um, in introduction, but I would like to highlight these quotes that really kind of cut to the quick for me um, and what I'm thinking about. So unless we write recipes for future kitchens, there's no reason to think we'll get food we like. So I'm thinking about how we can work with communities to write those recipes for future kitchens. Um, can any one of us here still afford to believe that efforts to reclaim the future can be private or individual? And that's from Audrey Lord. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, folk life is a collective and creative um, action. And I think so too is future building. Um, and that's kind of in opposition to the sort of startup genius um, narrative we're fed um, that will be saved by, you know, someone who will invent something that will reverse climate change. But I really think solutions for this exist within communities. And then Elaine Perkey, we're fighting for a future, don't you understand? Um, so I'll read a little bit from the end of the introduction here. <coughs> In the face of enclosure and privatization, which destabilize communities and force them to market and commodify their cultural heritage, as well as deindustrialization and environmental disaster, which can break up place-based communities from which folklore is created, resistance and self-determination can be found by reaffirming the common and collective and redeploying that back on the destructive and deracinating forces. As folklorist and activist Kay Turner asserted in her 2017 presidential address to the American Folklore Society, collectively owned narratives offer a counterpoint to the singular and reductive me story that capitalism favors. These shared narratives allow the willing suspension of disbelief to stimulate imaginative identifications and attachments. In a place where depopulation and disenfranchisement are not just byproducts, but also strategic objectives of industrial extractive capitalism, expressive culture that is rooted in community and place is subversive. As Frank Proshan writes, social functions and deepest meanings of folk traditions are often displayed most clearly and compellingly at times of social stress. There's not a better place to examine how that works than West Virginia. Long approached effectively as a sacrifice zone by governmental and corporate entities, 
West Virginia communities have experienced the violence of industrial corporate greed, bearing the brunt of the environmental and social disintegration it brings. The localities, groups, and social networks that live here have adapted and reformed in response through outright rejections of austerity, perpetual performances of counter-narratives, and gatherings around expressive culture. Those expressions which bolster community identity and affirm shared values can be a powerful tool in collective struggle. The challenges West Virginia faces are not unique to the state. Environmental hazards and climate change, post-industrial fallout, the disintegrating social safety net, loss of land and community, corporate malfeasance, structural racism, and a widening gap between the rich and poor are structural problems faced by the entire country. Their impact can just be more glaringly obvious in Appalachia. What I hope this book reveals is not only the power, but also the possibility of folk life, as well as communities and cultural workers' engagement with it, not merely as a source of counteractive resistance, but also as a productive, creative, and visionary force. As communication studies scholars Ken Ono and John Sloop state, vernacular discourse does not exist only as counter-hegemonic, but also as affirmative, articulating a sense of community that does not function solely as oppositional to dominant ideologies. Perhaps the struggles, responses, and creative possibilities of West Virginia communities, developed in some case in the direst of conditions, can offer a model for other places and futures. In my conclusion, I turn from a focus on the present formation of cultural traditions to the future, considering how communities and cultural workers can adopt a visionary outlook. I ask, what can we do today that will enable communities in the future to share local collective knowledge and be self-determining in their approach to their folk life traditions? And reflexively, how can cultural expression bolster collective identity and self-determination? I hope that as cultural workers and community members, we not only question, but also act on those visions in our work. In presenting this critical picture of West Virginia folk life as I've encountered it, I also aim to convey to the reader a sense of the work of a public folklorist, particularly, particularly the dialogic nature of the collaborative ethnographic fieldwork process, from interview to relationship building, to the meaningful presentation of that shared story in the world. The conversation among people and communities I write about was already in progress. Through, through field work, I asked to enter the conversation, to be oriented to it, and become part of it, sometimes minimally, other times centrally. The people I worked with generously invited me in. Though the focus of this book is on the communities themselves, I hope the following chapters also communicate what it means to be entrusted with these stories to bear that responsibility, and to develop powerful relationships across positionalities. Through writing this book, I've come to understand that the nature of my work as a public folklorist is to offer my assistance to local communities in recognizing themselves as collectivities with some shared identity and history, even if contested. Communities that, through shared creative expression, can together realize the power of self-determination in making their Take some questions now. <laughs> yes. Where are you originally from? I grew up in Indiana. Indiana. Well, it actually, I mean, people are definitely sharing folklore online. Um, so people, like, I play the fiddle, and I can go learn a fiddle tune on YouTube. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, if you go to Clifftop, the Old Time Festival in West Virginia, there's a lot of people from all over the world who have learned West Virginia fiddle tunes online. <laughs> and they actually, like, there's a large Japanese contingent um, and many of these players, you know, bow for bow, um, are able to learn West Virginia fiddle tunes. So in a way, it is expanding um, the way traditional culture can be shared. Um, I'm also a knitter, so I go on Ravelry and look at patterns from, you know, people post from around the world. Um, so 
that's definitely a way that folklore is being shared, video games, which is the last chapter of my book. Um, but there is something, you know, that you, you miss, like not being face-to-face. -face. And so we always kind of privilege that face-to-face -face, um, interaction and being able to sit knee-to-knee -knee with someone and, you know, learn a fiddle tune. Definitely, yep, mm -hmm. that's true. Um, well, it's definitely not an exhaustive, I don't claim for it to be an exhaustive picture of West Virginia in any sense. Um, I really think of the chapters of case study as case studies and the um, the press wanted a hundred thousand word <laughs> book. Um, but there was one chapter I really wanted to do um, on Moorfield, and I actually ended up doing a story with, um, with Clara um, on the, a coffee ceremony, a retreat coffee ceremony in Moorfield. But I really wanted to do one on um, immigrant communities in Moorfield around the chicken processing plant. Um, but when I was starting to do that work was right when COVID hit and um, there were some outbreaks in the factory and um, it just seemed like it was not a good idea, um, just, you know, even for the safety of the people I would be working with. So um, that didn't make it in the book, unfortunately. Um, I did, when I was um, kind of figuring out what the chapters would be, I really wanted to focus on the collective aspect of folklore. So. Um, I, you know, I talked to a lot of practitioners and interviewed them, and those interviews are in our collection at um, WVU Libraries, which you can go listen to. Um, but I really wanted to focus on the community nature of folk life. So even with the women songwriters, um, though they were kind of practicing in a private context, um, I saw this kind of pattern across their work that they're all part of this tradition of women songwriting. So that's that's sort of what I wanna wanted to highlight in the eight chapters. <clears throat> you find like for your time in the folk forest in West Virginia and the research you've already done with this book, are there some communities or like small communities that are kind of losing that connection to what you were a part of about the history? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, communities, you know, one of the things I write about in the conclusion is that you can't really separate um, the material conditions of a place from its folk life traditions. And so in order for people to be able to pass on their folk life traditions, they need to have their basic needs met. Um, so I think in communities where there is a lot of poverty and there's a lack of affordable housing and you know, um, uh, hunger and you know, needs are not being met, I think that that really um, could disrupt folk life traditions because people just don't have time um, to practice them or the ability to do so. So, um, yeah, that is something I kind of call for at the end for folklorists and cultural workers to be better advocates to make sure um, those community needs can be met so people can have the, the freedom to practice their traditions. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I think one of the things I wanted to start at the West Virginia Folk Life Program that I think Jenny Williams, the new state folklorist, is going to take up um, was a community documenters program. So um, that will train, offer kind of classes for people to learn how to do interviews and take good recordings um, so they can interview members of their own community um, and traditional artists. Um, and practitioners. So I think that's one way. Um, and even without that, you know, there are, we, you know, many people have cell phones now and there is decent recorders in there. So I encourage everyone to, um, you know, interview your elders and talk to them about what it was like growing up. I have done a bunch with my grandma and um, there's also a StoryCorps app you can use um, 
and actually upload your interview directly to the Library of Congress um, if you want it, you know, your interview with an elder to be preserved. Um, so I encourage people to do that. Uh, then there's programs like the West Virginia Folk Life Apprenticeship Program that pair um, mentor artists with younger artists, um, and they work together for a year uh, and get a stipend to pass those traditions on, make sure they continue with the next generation. Um, well, I was living in D.C. Um, at the time, and I play old-time music, so I had been to West Virginia uh, quite a bit for that, and um, also would go ski at White Grass, the cross-country ski place in the Canaan Valley. Um, so I had spent some time in West Virginia and was really interested in it um, generally. So, And I had done some work in Helvetia already. Um, so yeah, it, it was something I was already curious about. Yeah, well, um, I have never met Dwight, although I've wanted to. Um, John Morris is a friend. Um, I nominated him for the National Heritage Fellowship, which he received, which was so awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, John Morris um, is an incredible fiddler from Clay County, and he, um, with his brother, started an old-time festival at the their family's land in Clay County. and. Um, their idea or their kind of vision for Old Time Festival was we're going to have a festival where the elders live and then the young people can come to the elders um, rather than the other way around. Um, but they had all kinds of different, you know, musicians from West Virginia and flat footers and dulcimer players and blues musicians and banjo players. Um, and there's a great documentary about one of their old time um, festivals. I think maybe it was in 74. Um, but yeah, John Morris is really a keeper of the tradition, the specific fiddle tradition of Clay County. And he's a great guy and did some labor activism as well. <laughs> the one line question was, they wanted to know where you stand on the coastal line. Much lighter. Yep. And, um, and if you sampled all the foods in your book. Um, I think so. Um, I think I've sampled all the foods. Uh, as far as coleslaw, I am a fan of coleslaw. I would say I'm a friend of coleslaw, and we have some we have some friends of coleslaw totes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my friend Dan Davis from Kinship Goods, and I saw a Kinship sweatshirt here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I like coleslaw. I still like yams. You know where they don't um, serve slaw. In, you get uh, kicked out if you ask for it. But I will say, when you eat a Yams hot dog, the chili is so spicy, it makes you want slaw. Um, so I'm, I'm pro coleslaw, but I respect the non-slaw hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Just a comment. Thank you for um, doing this because it keeps us positive. Look at West Virginia because most of you are about to tune in. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, of course. You well, know, I'm surprised wrestling is in there. I can't wait to tell my friend Pittsburgh because he gets all kinds. Oh, that's cool. It's all happens. Yeah, I kind of Yeah, I kind of became a wrestling fan. Um, but yeah, in a way, it's this is kind of my love letter back to the state in all its complexity. Um, but yeah, I I love West Virginia, and I hope that comes through in the book. Yeah, 
Um, well, I live in Berea, Kentucky. My partner teaches at Berea College, and um, I'm actually still working in West Virginia, so I work for Mid-Atlantic Arts, a regional arts organization, and we work in West Virginia, and we have a Central Appalachia project in West Virginia, Ohio, and uh, Virginia, and then the other Mid-Atlantic states as well. So I'm still working here, so I, I haven't left it behind, uh -huh. even though I live in Kentucky now. Well, I have some books and some merch. Um, I'm happy to sign books um, if you're interested. But thank you so much thank for you. coming. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>